Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a place that's near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, the actual title of my talk uh, this evening is a little bit different, perhaps the program, a little enticing. The Promise of Stem Cells, The Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, the real work that I'm going to be talking about actually has been done here at CSU in the Cole Earhart's lab. Uh, Megan's here, uh, Steve Withrow, this old guy sitting here. Uh, <coughs> we've been working together, I think, since 1984. So it's been a, a, a real labor of love, and uh, it's uh, been very exciting uh, working with everyone here. So I would like to introduce uh, the stem cell, my old friend. Um, stem cells, uh, as you know, have a, 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 an exciting history. They're sexy. Uh, you can't pick up a newspaper without hearing about stem cells, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, we started our work with stem cells back in 1984. We developed techniques using the patient's own stem cells in their bone marrow, mixing that with pr naturally occurring proteins that we get from donors um, and, and dogs, other things. Uh, we can mix those together. We can inject those percutaneously into bones that don't heal. It's a 30-minute outpatient procedure rather than a two-hour orthopedic operation. Uh, just as successful uh, in many cases, and we're able to grow bone and get bones to heal. So this was, our, this was my introduction into this whole idea that there's cells in your body that don't know what they're going to do, but if you give them the right signal, uh, they'll figure it out. So the promise of stem cells, you know, really the headlines, it's just, I mean, they're, you know, crime, disease, everything's going to go away because stem cells are on the horizon. <laughs> Deafness, cure your heart, cure AIDS, Parkinson's, sickle cell, diabetes, your joints. We'll be out of business, orthopedic surgeons are going to be out of business because of stem cells. And this is just a potential list. The only one I worried about was this hair thing. But, <clears throat> but I would also submit that actually none of these things have really come to fruition yet. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the issues um, with these uh, promises. The hype for not only this medical uh, issue, but many, as you know. How many times have you picked up the newspaper and says, cure for cancer, you know, this and that. Um, and it's really an issue in our society, especially in the United States. And it's been well described. Uh, Gartner, it's called the Gartner hype uh, uh, cycle, which I think is fascinating. <laughs> so, you know, it's announced. We've got this new technology, and everybody goes absolutely crazy, and all of these expectations, we're going to cure cancer, AIDS, all this stuff. But then people actually try to do it. And all of a sudden they go, oh man, this is hard. <laughs> and then you end up here and say, oh, what did we get ourselves into? And then we go on and, uh, and, and go up and onward. I would uh, submit that uh, the stem cell area is about here. We've learned pretty quickly what we can't do, uh, but also very quickly now we're, we really are learning what we can do and, and what the possibilities are. And I would submit that uh, many of you are going to be involved in that, and it's really uh, very exciting. So now we're going to talk about the real part of stem cells, the things we can actually do today, and then we'll get into the future a little bit. So what can we do today, uh, this idea of regenerative medicine? Now you may know about orthopedic surgeons. <clears throat> we, we are not renowned for being the smartest people in the world. We're very good with our hands, and we're carpenters. Um, so you get into the stem cell and chemistry, and all, you say, where do stem cells come from? And uh, I have pretty firm feelings about this. A lot of the stem cell research in the past, as you know, has come from embryonic tissue. Um, I will submit also, without going into great detail, uh, we don't really need to do this very much anymore. Why? Because we've learned how to take more mature cells that are still stem cells, we can even reverse engineer them and turn them into embryonic cells without having to use embryonic cells. Um, so uh, in the work that we're doing now, and most labs actually are going away from embryonic uh, stem cells. So where do they come from? Well, in your body, dogs, animals, most stem cells come either from bone marrow, okay, bone marrow derived stem cells, or believe it or not, adipose tissue, fat, uh, which seems to be pretty prevalent, especially in this country. 
But there's two sources of that as well. There's your, your own body, okay? You can take your own fat or your own marrow and get stem cells from that. Uh, but really the best source and the, and the most um, uh, widely used source now is from a donor. So that it, at Allosource, you saw Allosource. Allosource um, is a, a not-for-profit tissue processor here in Colorado. It's the world's largest provider of stem cells. It's also the world's largest provider of skin for burns and live skin and fresh joints and all these things we do. So uh, it's a very exciting field, but we take donor tissue from kidney and liver and tissue donors and we can isolate the stem cells from the fat. And believe it or not, there's many, much more uh, stem cell tissue and fat than bone marrow or any other tissue. And we're able to engineer those cells. So that's kind of important. So now what really are stem cells? The best analogy that I've found, and I've had kids, stem cells are like teenagers sitting on the couch in front of the television. They don't have a clue what they're supposed to do. But they have huge potential, huge potential. But the secret is, and the most important thing about stem cell research isn't the stem cells themselves, it's the signal. It's the signal to turn this person into a CPA, or this person into a lawyer, or this person into a veterinarian. And that's the hard part. In your own lives, think of how you got where you are and all those signals and all that environment and all that stuff. That's really the secret of stem cells. It's not the stem cells themselves, it's the signal. And that's why it's so hard. It's not easy. So here's just a little diagram. Very simple. And you look at this and say, oh, well, you just need this little thing here to turn a stem cell into a bone cell. Well, it's a little oversimplified. There's at least 100 other proteins and cofactors that are needed to even head this direction. And it's all got to be there at the right proportion, right concentration, and at the right time, or it doesn't work. And again, thinking about raising kids and doing all that, you say, well, how in the world are they going to get? It's that complicated. It really is. But the nice thing about stem cells is if they do get the right signal, it really does work. And most of the work that we've done uh, has to do with bone regeneration. And that, again, all this work has done generally been done here at CSU, because with bone, you need cells, you need a scaffolding, and you need this signaling. And we use naturally occurring signals that occur in the bone itself, all these proteins, that we can combine together. The cells see that signal, use the bone for scaffolding, and voila, you have bone. And this is work that has been very successful and is used today. This is a, a scanning photo micrograph up here. You see stem cells sticking to bone. It sticks, they stick naturally to bone, demineralized bone. The proteins are active. And in fact, then they start growing, and they start growing to the point where they actually grow bone. And it's very successful, and it's used, again, on a daily basis in this country. This is all work that originally was done in animals, now done in humans. This is all human um, uh, material, so that we know we can grow bone using donor stem cells from fat with the right um, uh, signal. The other neat thing about bone is, since the scaffolding has the proteins within it, you can form the scaffolding into the shape that you want. So we have cubes and strips and morselized and all that stuff to use in the carpentry of orthopedics. So if you want to use a lot of little croutons, you can use that. If you need a strip for a spinal fusion, you can fashion it. We add the stem cells into that, and it grows bone. And this is an example of a case um, this was a kid that had cancer, um, it was mentioned earlier, osteosarcoma, the same uh, cancer the dogs get kid. Normally you'd have an amputation at the shoulder, we transplant a new shoulder in with a donor bone, the host accepts that, but we have to get those two to heal together. And we, we can use the stem cells with uh, the bone that we use for the graft, and it forms very hard, strong bone, and it heals together and it's been a great uh, way to get these bones to heal to the host. The most common use today of stem cells in human medicine is spinal fusion, lumbar fusion. There are, there are literally thousands and thousands of these cases done every year in the United States using stem cells. The nice thing about this is, again, it's naturally occurring stem cells, naturally occurring proteins, they're not pharmacologic, they're not toxic, there's not side effects, um, and it really does work, and it achieves 
this, this idea that we can get bones to heal together even when sometimes uh, it's not likely they would do that. This is an example of one of my cases. This is a young lady, it was a car accident. And it's a little hard to see, but she shattered her femur. This is the bone uh, above the knee. And you can see here, bones missing, a lot of stuff's gone. Well, she's already had three bone grafts to try to get this to heal from her own pelvis. And if any of you have had bone grafts, you know that's not a little operation. You claw the bone out of there, painful, um, and it'd be great if it worked, but it didn't even work in her case, three times. So that we use stem cells on here, on her, here's right after surgery, three weeks after surgery, and at three weeks she's already starting to heal that bone. And at three months she's healed, running back to normal activities. So this stuff really does work, and it's pretty, <laughs> We do this every day, you don't have to applaud. <laughs> <clears throat> so, but it is, it's exciting, because for the first time ever, we can really control healing. You know, I was trained as a carpenter, orthopedics, but now like we're gardeners. We do these things and things grow uh, where they didn't before, so it is really exciting, um, and uh, it is real, really the future. So what are some of the problems and what are the things we deal with currently? So this is an example of a case that was actually sort of mentioned early. This was a, a, a lady that had cancer, bone cancer, and osteosarcoma in her femur, normal procedures and amputation at the hip. We were able to take out the cancer. This is an allograft bone, so that's a donor bone, same size and shape. Uh, we treat it, we clean it, we wash it, and we replace the cancerous bone with somebody else's bone. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. There is, you say, well, wait a minute, that's somebody else's bone. Is there an immunologic issue? And there is, not a huge one, but there is, and that slows down healing. Then once we done, have done the surgery, then we put them on chemotherapy. And chemotherapy, I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's toxic, it's hard. We're trying to kill cancer without killing the patient. But that also slows down bone healing. By using stem cells, and in fact, in this case, we did use stem cells, not only are we get, can we get the bone to heal, but the stem cells, and this is something just, just recently, Dr. Earhart in her lab was able to show, it alters the immune response to that bone. So that's kind of like, we didn't know that, but it's true. And so these other things that stem cells do, other than replacing and regenerating, we call them immunomodulators. It changes local effects of uh, the immune system. It helps maybe even fight infection. So it's really exciting uh, new research, and again, or originated here at CSU. The other thing they found, and again here at CSU, uh, with some of the work we've done, I talked about the, sorry. I'm on call, sorry. Um, the other, I talked about the environment. So we talked about proteins in the environment, that's sort of in the fluid environment. But the other thing we've learned, something as simple as the surface upon which the cells grow can influence what the cells become. And so depending on what surface we grow those cells on, we can turn them into bone cells uh, without having to use uh, all of those complex signals. It's just the surface alone that can do that. So that's really exciting because that simplifies things dramatically. So by altering the surface of the bone or the allograft or something else, that should really help in some of the things that we do. One of the largest problems we currently have in orthopedics is replacing joints and bones with metal. And it's, and it's I mean, there's gonna be a million joint replacements this year in the United States. But the problem is occasionally it's a bad deal. And this is a lady, her whole pelvis is dissolved, literally, uh, in reaction to the metal and, and the inflammation and things. We've tried for years to get these metal objects to actually stick and grow into bone, but it really hasn't been success very successful. Then come stem cells and nanotechnology and the surface work that we do. And it's a combination of the surface and the cells and whatever we want to deliver, whether it's drugs or antibiotics, and then the prosthesis itself. So this nanotechnology, these are titanium microtubular tubules, and they're like, the, the diameter here is the diameter of one cell, okay? So we can actually put cells within those tubules, and those stem cells then grow into the bone, 
and very intimately then the bone grows into the prosthesis and it's dead. I mean, it's, it's stuck there, it's part of the bone and it becomes like a bio implant, almost like a cyborg sort of thing. So that's really exciting and we have all the proof to go with that. And again, that's all work that's done here at CSU. So, you know, there's some subtle things in life and there's some not so subtle things. Um, in, the, in the business that we do, uh, we do a lot of weird trauma. Somebody gets their arms or legs cut off, we're the ones that put it back on. And there's a lot of damage done. And one of the problems with this is the bone, again, it's carpentry, we can replace the bone, all that stuff. But the blood vessels, the blood vessels are difficult to replace. Um, you can use their own blood vessels. We have cadaver blood vessels, they clot quickly. So this idea that the plumbing in your body uh, and how we replace that has always been an enigma. So we've uh, now started a cooperative um, adventure, if you will, with a company from the East Coast, and they have now figured out how to use human stem cells from donors, and we put it in a bioreactor, and it's a tube filled with fluid, just like blood, and it's got a pump, so it's pumping just like a heart would, and there is a tube of a biodegradable uh, scaffold. We put the stem cells in there, and the stem cells grow on the scaffold, and they literally make a blood vessel. And it's a normal blood vessel because of the mechanical and all the other things we do. The biodegradable part dissolves away, so what we're left with then is a, a blood vessel, any diameter that we would like to make it, any length we would like to make it, uh, to replace human blood vessels. And this is now in, in FDA human trials here in the United States. So for cardiac, oops, cardiac surgery, cardiac surgery, peripheral vascular surgery, uh, access to dialysis, um, this is gonna be the new thing we think, and it's all because of stem cells. So, in closing, Stem cells really have the potential uh, to be anything they want to be. So uh, this, the parental stem cell advice, you can be anything you want to be. But if you don't remember anything that I've said, just remember the teenagers on the couch. Because that's it, it, it's, it, this is exactly what it's like. And, and, and we can take it so far, but it's all you in this room and the other room. You're the ones that have to figure out the signals and the systems and the bioreactors to have those stem cells do the work, to make what we need to regenerate, to replace almost anything, but it's the signal. And that's the exciting part of this, and it's, and it's something that you should all be excited about. So thank you for your attention.